Hey guys, Saf coming at you with another Raid Shadow Legends video and in today's video we're going to be doing a champion guide on White Queen Ancora. She is the most recent fusion apart from the new one that just got announced for the 5th anniversary celebration. So we're going to be taking a look at Ancora. Now she has been an especially big focus for me since uh, I've managed to get Narsus. We're not really going to be looking at Narsus in this video. I've done that in a previous champion guide. What we're going to be really looking at is how you can use White Queen Ancora in your account if you didn't have Narsus. And we're also going to contextualize it a little bit in terms of okay if I do have him what does what does the partnership bring but generally I want to focus exclusively on Ancora on her own and in terms of what she can bring for your team so let's just run through her skill sets very quickly. We have an A1 Necrobolt attacks. One enemy has a 30% chance, which books to 50% chance of decreasing the cooldown of a random ally skill by two turns, except this champion. This is actually quite useful. It's only a 50-50 chance, but it does mean that it's in places like Hydra, you can get really powerful abilities back a lot quicker. Two turns is quite good. Most skills are three to four turn cooldown, so you're getting about half to 75% of your turn back. It's very powerful. Now, obviously, if White King Nars is on the team, he takes takes that cooldown if he has a skill on cooldown otherwise it will go on a random ally skill if she fully resets the cooldown of that skill for the champion she'll also heal them by 10 percent it's kind of a minor aspect one thing to note it does make it so that in white king narcissus it's still a 50 50 percent even when white king narcissus is in the team it's not a hundred percent because the king is with her so you get a 50 percent chance to turn cooldown uh, as you can see, I've missed one book here. I would probably think that this is worth booking. It's a very good skill to use in general areas. Then we have the A2 Shield of Imaria. Removes all debuffs from all allies. Great, that's exactly what we want. Places a shield buff on them equal to 25% of this champion's max HP. 25% of this champion is quite good if you build her with high HP. You'll see in my build that I have. If White King Narcissus is on the same team, she gets a strength in as well. That's not always going to be the case, especially if you didn't get him. And then fills the turn meter of all allies. So we get a cleanse, shield, and a 10% turn meter fill. The only downside to this ability is you don't get the block debuffs after the cleanse, which is very desirable to have. You think of champions like Elva Autumnborn. She cleanses, then places block debuffs. So it just keeps you, you know, from being re-debuffed. It's the only downside to this, but it's a very good shield, a very good cleanse. It's on a three turn cooldown as well, so it's going to happen quite a lot. Then we have a uh, revive rise my love level three three turn cooldown when you book it revives a dead ally with 50 percent hp and 75 percent turn meter that's very important it's a very very significant amount of turn meter one of the most important things about a reviver is getting back to your abilities what one of the main weaknesses if not the principal weakness of duchess she revives the team great but they have no turn meter so it takes you a long time to get back to a turn if she revives the king he gets a bit more bonus like basically 25% more turn meter, 25% more HP. After the revival, decreases the turn meters of all enemies by 10 turns. Now, the most important thing about this, resets the cooldowns of the revived ally skills. If anyone has used Godseeker and Arian Sand Devil, you know how powerful this can be. It's very, very good. Now, she can't replace Godseeker and Arian because she doesn't have a self-revive. The thing about Godseeker and Arian, she will self-revive whenever she gets nuked. But this is very good if someone dies, especially in like an arena context or some, or anything like that. You can reset the cooldowns, give them turn meter, give them a good amount of HP, and then they can go and do whatever they want. And then you also get another 10% turn meter drop. Now you will need accuracy for this. This is the only aspect of her kit that requires accuracy uh, to, to actually do anything, unless the king is here. If the king is here, then the accuracy goes away. Or you can just decide you just don't want the turn meter um, decrease happening. If you're doing using it mainly for boss content, then that doesn't really matter. You just build her with no accuracy. Then we have the passive. Now the passive is what makes her really interesting for places like Hydra. Whenever an enemy tries to place a fear, true fear, freeze, etc. on the ally with the highest crit damage, transfers those debuffs to this champion instead. So it's a little bit like Lady Mikage's passive where whenever she takes a turn, she cleanses it off the highest attack. This one's picking the highest crit damage. So if you want to make sure that a champion within your team never gets controlled, put them with the highest crit damage. She will take that debuff. She will fill her turn meter if she then if procs those CC. So for example, if she has true fear and she tries to take an ability and she can't take those turns, then she will get 50% turn meter fill. If she's stunned she will, and the, the stun is not cleansed, she will get 50% turn meter fill. This is on a three turn cooldown, but if you book it fully, it's permanently active. As you can see, my books did not land on this as of yet. This is something I would 100% book in all scenarios. Now, if the king is on the team, it's slightly different. She's actually going to remove the debuff before she takes a turn. So that's 
a big difference because it means that she becomes immune to CC effectively or when you book it. Uh, obviously, it's a unique ability, so it can't apply to everything. We get a 19% speed aura. So with this ability, we're really looking for high CC environments with something specifically like the Torment Head. She can keep two champions completely free. And because she then has a cleanse, she becomes quite an interesting option for the actual the Hydra boss. Now, it's a bit of a shame that you need Narsus here to make it so that she doesn't skip a turn, uh, like this, this cleanse, because that is a bit of a problem because Narsus is not exactly crazy good in hydra but perhaps he's worth considering in a very good decent damage build just to enable this fear if you don't have things like shamael if you don't have things like duchess or feral if you don't have an option for that fear head this could be a pretty good option if you've managed to pick her up so that's her skill sets let me take you through how i've built it i've gone the the sort of high hp high resist bolster route because i've built it predominantly for my arena team with my white king narcissus another option you could go is guardian that actually works really well because it's all about protecting your team. I definitely think because her shield is based on HP, you want to prioritize health on this champion. You really want to go as high as HP as you can. The bigger her HP pool, the bigger the shield that you would get on that A2, not just bolster. I like bolster because it gives you the heal as well as the initial shield. So you get a bit of initial sort of effective HP and then you get a continuous sustain for her as well. So she takes a bit of damage. Now, like I said, in my build, I've built it more predominantly for arena. You do not need this level of resistance for any other content. This is how much I've got her for arena at 821. Probably if you want to make her immune to things like the mischief head and things like that, you need to run about 400. That 450 will do the job on Nightmare. I do think having good speed on her is a good idea. Don't build her for damage. I mean, she's got crit damage here purely from the blessing. You can see I've put no focus for my artifacts into crit damage whatsoever. Just, there's no point building her damage. She just it, she attacks with one ability on the A1. She's not a damage dealer. So don't worry about crit rate. It's really not worth it. Try to get yourself with a decent amount of defense. Something like 3.2 to 4,000 is a good window to make sure she doesn't die. Um, very good defense for this. And then as much HP as you can. Again, you don't need accuracy unless you don't have Narcissus and you want this turn meter drop. If you don't care for this turn meter drop, then you don't need accuracy. So you can put all of your stat focus into health, defense, speed, and if you want it, resistance. It's quite easy to build. Now, if you did go for the five star and Corusol, a blessing choice is available to you and five star gives you significant options. One of the main options you wish that would work but that was not gonna work is Brimstone. Brimstone until it's six star requires accuracy and she doesn't really benefit from having accuracy. Now, if you're going for that turn meter drop and you've built up for some accuracy, then Brimstone would be a pretty good option. It's a 60% chance on a single hit, it's not bad. And if you're using her predominantly in PVE content, it's pretty good as a blessing. Now, other options here, she does have a speed aura, so you could take Intimidating Presence, that would boost your speed by 15%. It's not significant though, it's, it's quite a weak option. It wouldn't be something I would go to first, but it's a great option if you don't need anything else, right? If you don't need the life harvest here because you don't plan on using her in arena, you don't have brimstone, so you don't have a six star, then you start running out of options. Perhaps just getting a bit more speed is a good option for you. Obviously, Heaven Cast is about damage now. She doesn't do any damage, so that's not really worth it. If you did want to make her a mischief tank, which is quite hard because she doesn't have any like significant self buffs, then Lightning Orb is a very good option for um, making sure that she gets the mischief tank. It gives you a bonus buff. So that could be an option you can go for. And then the final two options, which are really kind of, you know, probably the best option here is temporal chains out of the final two options. It will slow the enemy down if they have buffs of any sort. And this works against bosses as well. So if Hydra gets some buffs, it will slow them down. Slowing the enemies down is a pretty significant factor. It will go up to 15%. So it's a quite a good, it's basically having half of a speed debuff, like a 30% speed debuff. It's like having a baby, like a mini speed debuff on the enemy quite good the other option is you can just bring soul reap if you want it will hit the threshold at 14 percent um so it can just finish off bosses for you if you get the boss below 10 percent hp it will execute the boss for you it's actually surprisingly quite good in some locations just keep in mind soul reap suffers in hydra because it's coded as aoe so you will lose about half of the damage it doesn't ignore things like shields and when it does hit enemies, it's enemy max HP, so it won't be able to exceed the 10% of hard mode bosses. So even though it's a, a threshold of 14%, it will cap it at 10% if it's in that kind of four, like 10 to 14% window. So those are the options I would go for. Now, if you're going for arena, I still haven't gone for polymorph at five star because you need accuracy. 
Again, she's not an accuracy champion, so therefore I'd be building accuracy just for the sake of polymorph. Doesn't make sense. If you were to get a six star, polymorph would be the way to go in arena. Otherwise, I actually think Life Harvest is excellent for her because the key thing is if something goes wrong, you need to get back to that revive. Turn meter is what you need. Cycle of Revenge, you know, the timely intervention, getting bonus turn meter. Life Harvest is perfect for this because if an enemy loses some people, you revive, you destroy the max HP, it helps you win the fight, it gives you turn meter. So that's why I've gone with this blessing options. So a quick summary, I would say probably Temporal Chain's Aura if you don't want to do any Arena Focus or Soul Reap. If you want to do an Arena Focus, absolutely 6-star Polymorph if you've got 6-star. Otherwise, temp uh, otherwise Life Harvest, I would suggest, is the best option. Masteries wise, I've gone for a completely support build. Um, this is an arena build. You can do uh, some different alterations here. Like if you're going purely PVE, I would go down the tough skin, blast proof and resurgent and go down and get the delayed death. Shadow heal is actually very good. I think more people should be putting more focus on shadow heal. Every time an enemy is healed, you get 6% um, of the max HP back. Very good into things like wave content, very good into things like sand devil. If you were to use her in that setting, I don't know if she will work. I've not tried it, but any places a heal is actually surprisingly good. Um, a good option and really when you look at the rest of the defense tree, like wisdom of battle is essential for arena, but otherwise not that valuable. I have gone down the Steadfast, the Shield Bearer, because she's going to be placing a shield and she's in a bolster set. Rapid response for some bonus turn meter. And then I've just gone for bigger shield and Laura Steel. I've stopped taking Cycle of Magic because we all know Amius is in rotations now. So I've stopped taking the random chance because it's just not worth having to remaster everyone if I need to use them in Amius. And especially support champions, especially champions with heal reduction, especially champions that heal block debuffs these champions if they come up in rotation are probably going to be the ones you want to use in amius so i've stopped taking cycle of magic as a result of that i haven't finished the masteries that's why she's still level 53 here i will probably come down and i will take i would imagine lasting gifts and then either deterrence or cycle of revenge for some more turn me to control elements so that is how i've built her she's predominantly in an arena build for me but you absolutely can lower the resistance, put it more into defensive stats, and the exact same build will work. Guardian sets are also very good on her. Uh, you can go Righteous sets for more resistance if you want. Protection sets, if you get to 9 out of 9, is very good for Hydra. Although, it works better when you have Narcissus. Without Narcissus, it's just a single buff. With Narcissus, it's 2. It would give you 10% more damage. It's very powerful. Uh, but definitely, I think Bolster or Guardian is the way to go with her. It will just keep her alive. Now, desirably for Arena, if you had it, I would definitely consider a one turn stone skin with a bolster set. A one turn stone skin with a bolster set would be better, but you need the accessories and I don't have them. If you have two accessories in stone skin, then you can do that setup. It just means that she's guaranteed to get a turn. So if you get CC'd, you get polymorphed, you get you know, annihilated, she will be okay. She'll be able to do something. Um, Defiant's not a bad set either as a filler two piece that gives a good amount of damage reduction from AoE attacks. And the majority of bosses are AoE. So where do I think she's best placed in PvE content? Well, we've talked a little bit about Hydra. Um, we can kind of see the effect here. I can kind of just throw it, her into a team here and take a look at how we work. Torment is up from the start. So um, we can probably just take these two out. Um, let's just bring in White Queen and Korra. And I'll just bring my Shu Zhen in for the sake of this. I'm trying to showcase this without Narsus so you can see the value if you didn't go for the guaranteed Narsus. I think that's really important. Uh, this just makes sure I get a turn. So at this point here, we don't really need to uh, do anything because all we're going to do is we're going to remove buffs and strengthen. So we don't really want to do that. But what we can do is A1 just for the time being. We can just kind of put some things out. And I'm going to proc the fear here. So you can see the fear. Now, you'll notice that Rathalos didn't get a fear because Rathalos has the highest crit damage in my team. So that means he is fine to do whatever he wants. So he can come in and he can whack some heads around here. Uh, so we can get a turn then. And at this point, this is where the partnership really would pay off. If she was in the partner, she'd get instantly cleansed if she was booked. She's not booked. So at this point, we would have been able to cleanse all the fears out that we can't. Let me show you this exactly with Narcissus, just to show like how it is quite good. I don't actually know if it's going to be possible to use Narcissus here. But even without it, when it's booked, it's still a pretty good chance of keeping one champion clear. So you always can make sure that happens. So like, for example, if you want to make sure your Provoker always doesn't get feared, make sure your Provoker has the highest crit damage. She will permanently cleanse that champion. She might not be able to um, cleanse everyone else, but at least she can permanently keep that champion from... Um, 
from being feared, which is obviously really important. The last thing you want is to miss your fear and then you can't then, you know, re-provoke. We don't want this head ever cleansing. So if you if you if you're if my archer here is is feared at the moment, this is where it's a disaster because essentially we cannot re-provoke it because we run the risk that we lose our ability. So having my archers to highest crit damage would mean that I would always cleanse her and then I would always have a provoke. That's where her value really comes into it. Even if you don't have the king. But when you have the king, you'll see what will happen here. We could just throw the king out, see how much damage it does. Not bad, 200k. Which is let the boss take a turn. And then you can see we get that instant cleanse, which means we can then cleanse. So this is where I think her, her ability could be really good with the king because it means it does give you an answer for this torment head if you don't have very good options for dealing with the torment head, if that is what you're struggling with. Now, in terms of the rest of her abilities, obviously she will give you a cleanse. So if we have got a poison cloud head out and we get provoked, we can cleanse again. And then what we're going to do is we're going to hopefully power some skills back. Now, this is where I think having the king is actually a detrimental to you because you don't always want the king to have his abilities on cooldown. I'd really like um I'd really like Ancora to continuously reduce the cooldown of my Rathalos, my damage dealer. That's who I really want. But you'll notice if I A1 then it's always going to focus Narsus. It's not great, which I really don't want it to do. So I'm going to take Narsus back out. I'm going to bring back in my Shuzhen. And we're going to see how much we can power through and get some abilities. So what I'm going to try and do is avoid using some abilities where I can to, so that I can basically make sure that we um, we always have Rathalos rocking and rolling. Now, obviously, we can't afford to completely not use some abilities, um, that's just the reality of the situation. We can one-shot that head here on normal. Obviously, it's only normal difficulty, so these are not very complicated waves um, at all. And really what we want to do here now is we want A1. Now, keep in mind, if you weak hit on the A1, you will not get the cooldown. So don't target the heads that are weak affinity. Always try to focus heads that are not. So we can do this. We didn't get one that time. That's unfortunate. We can give her another turn. Try and reset the cooldown. What we we didn't re we reset the 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 thing. That's the only downside. It is random, so it's not always, especially when you have six enemy uh, six allies in your team. It will reduce the chances that you get the actual cooldown that you want, which is, you know, you want Rathalos here. I want him to have his cooldown reduced as many times as I can. We can keep giving turns here. I could absolutely be giving that to, um, to my Rathalos. We got it on Michinaki this time. This would be very good in situations where you are not concerned about which champion gets the cooldowns. This will hurt you in clan boss to the extent where you probably cannot use her in clan boss. But in situations like Hydra, where if you get an extra A2 from a Rathalos, that's great. You know, that's really what you want. If you get an extra A2 from Rathalos, brilliant. That's huge amounts of damage. You know, you get in these stars aligned moment. That's really what you want to do. So we can actually just throw out some decreased speed here and then just throw out some of this. And then do we get a reset? We didn't get a reset that time. So it's not going to be very consistent, but it could work quite well. We get this huge hit here, 840. Didn't quite get what we needed to. Give this an extra turn. See if we can reduce the cooldown. There was that weak hit that I was talking about. If you weak hit, it doesn't work. So you absolutely can't weak hit. Let's see if we get it here. Oh, we didn't get it that time either. So it's going to be inconsistent. Obviously, I'm 10% lower. But absolutely, you can see where I'm going with this. If you can get a lot of cycling the abilities, if you can cycle the abilities quicker, then you potentially could do a lot of damage to these heads and really improve your Hydra key um, significantly. We got it on Shujen that time. It seems to be dodging Rathalos uh, with, with a plague. Um, but absolutely, this is why I think she's very good. If you bring the king, you get full immunity. Try to make sure that the, the person with the highest crit damage, the champion that gives you the highest amount of crit damage, is the one that you are happy that that's the one that you want to keep f the fear debuff off because that's how it targets the one with the highest crit damage and that could be a provoker it could be a turn meter booster it could be a main damage dealer it just gives you a level of options for this fear head now other places you can use her obviously you can use her in doom tower climbing right i've finished all of hard rotation here but some of these waves can be quite nasty my normal hard doom tower climbing team is this team it's a combination of uko for a sort of crowd control we use uh, and, and obviously buff stripping we use oella we use then this double nuke option i don't have any kaimars myself so it means that i can't really depend on the re the, the seer double reset option i have to look elsewhere so that is a bit of a difference for me now she can absolutely come in and she can replace the oella as a cleanser and a healer although she doesn't really heal that well so it's probably better to replace the the, the uko here 
So if we can bring that Uko in here, high resist, which means we still get the aura, we still get a lot of control. We will lose the actual debuffing ability here, but you can see this team, we're gonna use Rathalos as well to make sure we lose all those block passive skills. And we've got our double damage dealer here. So we just reset the Rathalos, uh, we just reset our Romanto abilities. So he can now basically use whatever he wants. Now we have told him to make sure he uses A1 once only on this wave. But when we come back to this wave now, we're gonna have another boost, another turn meter control. And you can just see that she's going to probably keep giving my skills back to my champions, which is really, really important in Doom Tower. Having access to the stuns, having access to the damage dealing abilities is very important. So we can see we're climbing through here. We are gonna basically keep powering through. Our Constantine and our Vlad do a lot of damage. They're very, very strong duo for carrying dungeons, these two. They, they block revive, they do a lot of damage. And you can just see that we're never really at risk of dying. I can probably pick a very more, a much more complicated. I might even take a look at 114 to see how it copes on 114 because that's the Stiffy Rotus wave. Um, we actually have as well Romantu giving us cooldown reduction. We did lose someone there, but we're going to get a revive back, reset their abilities, and then we can hopefully go again if we are fast enough. Oh, died again. Okay, so, you know, this is the situation you can have, but we get a cleanse there. We didn't have any abilities at the start of this turn, which is the main risk when this can happen. And this would be like where you don't auto the content. But hopefully she stays alive. She's tanking it up a bit. Oella's given us a bit of heal. We get Vlad back, but we're not going to be able to keep anyone alive because we didn't debuff the waves. So this is the problem when you just auto something. Uh, we obviously weren't paying attention, but she's she's holding her own. She's staying alive. This is why I, uh, I suggested build her with a bit of defensiveness, a bit of tankiness. She'll be able to stay alive with Oella here for quite a while. We get a revive. Are we going to get a turn? Where we are, we, we lock him out now. So this is going to help. And notice how she's healing as well when the shadow heal comes in. Some of these some of these enemies can heal when they attack, specifically the Brachus. When Brachus attacks you, he heals. Every time Brachus was attacking, she was healing with shadow heal. So it's helping sustain her. So she's been able to recover this fight when it looked pretty dodgy. So that's why I was talking about shadow heal being very useful for wave content. If you're fighting healing opponents, they will help you carry through. We looked like we were going to fail. We could leave it run auto and it's been able to clear floor 103 quite comfortably in about 66 turns there. She was able to tank it. That's why I suggest you build her with defensive stats. It will keep your team alive. Let's take it to 114. This is probably one of the hardest waves in all of Doom Tower. It is a nasty setup here at the start. We have got double Rotus, a uh, triple Rotus, double Siffy. We can obviously take the passives away, but you'll see it is a bit frustrating. She took the sleep. So this is where her passive is coming in. She took the sleep, which meant that we absolutely could take a turn. So we're able to take out one Rotus. Now we're going to take out the next ones. And then we are just going back here. Now, obviously we didn't get a cleanse. We haven't got Narsus. So she got two meter boosted, but she still got slept because the Siffy is still there. So now we've got to basically fight our way back. Hopefully we get a turn and we get a revive. There we go, revive comes in. We're, we're fighting through. This is really like the hardest wave in Doom Tower, I would say. It's, it's one of the ones that people get absolutely stuck on. Now you could say you're using two void legendaries here with Constantine and Vlad. I'm just giving you an example of some damage dealers. You could use any damage dealer you want in this position. You could absolutely use a uh, more of a control, crowd control. But what she's doing is she's stabilizing the team. If anyone dies, we've got to revive. We're resetting our abilities and we're just keeping the team cleansed from debuffs. We've almost taken down this wave. There's a revive back again. Take out that. And now we've got through wave one. So now we've got wave two again. It's still the same situation. We have Siffy Rotus. Pretty nasty to deal with. We're probably going to lose our Constantine. The freeze got transferred, if you noticed. I think it, it said target changed, but she seemed to be immune to the freeze. I'm not entirely sure why. Maybe she resisted the effect. That's probably working. So when when she transfers it over, she checks her own resistance against the enemy. So we actually were able to transfer the freeze from her passive. Now remember, my passive is not booked. If it was booked every single time a sleep or a freeze gets applied, it would transfer through to her. This is why I think her passive is well worth booking. And you can see it's a very stable and strong carry. Now, if you had the White King Narsus, he would absolutely take one of the DPS slots here. Life Harvest is coming into effect here. Even if we're not in Arena, Life Harvest. Look at the value of this Life Harvest. It has absolutely destroyed the Rotus' max HP. It's not as good on Rotus because Rotus' passive will still apply even at half health. So it becomes even harder to kill him because I can't just one-shot his passive from the rest of the health because his passive will adjust to the maximum current HP, not the actual, like destroyed so it's still a bit tricky but it absolutely you can see the value of life harvest in these revive teams 
in terms of slowing and making it easy to re-kill those enemies. So we're going to take away these. We're probably going to lose a few here. The Rotus is doing his thing. This is, you know, scary. We are going to lose some maximum HP here. But we reset our Roman to A3, which is very good against these types of waves because we are facing um, enemies who have really strong passives. So being able to reset that ability is huge. And we are full auto in this. I've not configured really much strategy or anything. We're just full auto in it. The, the Vlad's got a five-star soul. The Constantine is glass cannon. The Romantu is just built with speed and accuracy, not really built that much defensiveness. The real two tanks here are Oella and Ancora, and they're doing a great job. Will we clear this wave out? Eventually, I would have thought. So there's that sleep coming through. Obviously, you cannot resist the Siffy sleep, so we can't really resist that. But I do have Wisdom of Battle specifically designed for arena Siffies. Um, so let's see what we get here. We bring our Constantine back. Will he survive? That's the question. We've lost a lot of max HP on our Oella, which kind of which does hurt. But there we go. Block revive. So we've just cleared probably the hardest floor of a Doom Tower with our Ancora resetting the Romantu's A2. Now I'm using Romantu. I know you're all going to be sitting in comments right now going, well, it's easy when you've got Romantu and Double Void Legendary. Yes, Romantu, but you could be using a Ronda to help you through these waves and using Ancora's A1 to reset Ronda's A2. There are other options to Romantu here. You don't, it's not like Romantu was the core reason I did this. Vlad is pretty much the main carry of this team because of his AoE decreased defense and uh, AoE uh, sort of decreased speed. So that's a really good setup here. Now, in terms of bosses, what is she good for in Doom Tower? She's not really going to be a champion you use for Dark Fate, to be honest. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because you don't really want to build any sort of tanky champions for Dark Fate. You want your Dark Fate to be, team to be quite squishy, but high turn meter control. Um, Grithian, probably quite good because he's going to send debuffs back at you. So you can cleanse those debuffs when you get them. I'm out of silver keys today because I will put all my keys into uh, Dark Face. So it's very difficult for me to show you. Scarab, you get a shield, but it is not on an A1 all the time. It could be quite good, but I do think as long as you have a Poisoner in Blood Shield, it becomes very easy with Regen. That's probably the best way to go. Uh, and Bommel, not really ideal, I wouldn't suggest. The only downside to Ancora is really going to be that you can never truly use her on... Amius, because of her A1 ability, it's going to reduce skill cooldowns. And of course, we know how terrible Cycle of Magic is to have on Amius. If you reduce your own cooldowns, you're going to reduce the cooldown of his passive. So she's pretty much disqualified from Ancor, uh, from Amius, unfortunately. But if you were ever to get into certain floors, like right now, she is going to be fronting up my S15. Once I finish rebuilding this out, I just need to speed up my Shemnath. My Shemnath is way too slow at the moment. I think it's only at like 2, 1, 3. I need to speed that up. And then this Ancora is going to carry me through this stage because of the cleansing of the debuffs from Finite Hard and Sorath. Because she's in high resist, we'll be fine. We won't take anything. And she can eat a freeze for one of my teams. So this kind of double boss setting is where she will absolutely shine. So she'll be having a, got a lot of value there. So... Out of the PvE areas, not very good for Clan Boss because you will mess up your speed turn. Potentially very good for Hydra because you can have the fears being transferred. You can make sure your Provoke Champion doesn't have a fear at all because you can put it in the highest crit damage and that champion becomes immune to Torment Head because the moment they get a fear, it will go straight onto the Ancora when she's booked. Even if Ancora doesn't take a turn, she still be keeps that Provoke Champion immune. It's very powerful for that. If you have the King, you can make it so that she becomes immune as well, so that she can cleanse the rest of the team. I think it's probably the best alternative to uh, a, a Shamael for all Duchess. If you don't have those, it's probably the best option beyond just killing the Torment Head. Doom Tower Wave Climbing, phenomenal. She probably absolutely hard carries the Faction War if it's open. And of course, she's a god in arena. In, in terms of other areas here, you could absolutely put her into Iron Twins as a stability option to keep your team stable and cleansed and healing. Uh, my Iron Twins team here is using Pythian for the cleanse with block debuffs, uh, but you could use her instead of Pythian, would do the same thing. It could work quite well if, you're, if your Geomancer dies a lot as well, because when she revives Geomancer, she's going to reset his abilities. He can burn straight away. So potentially very good for Iron Twins as well. Um, and then I think in terms of these core dungeons, not going to be very good for Sand Devil. She doesn't self-revive, which is a shame. For Shogun's Grove, I don't really think she brings anything of much value here because 
you generally, to do Shogun's Grove, you want the Riho. If you don't have the Riho, you're going the, the Gnarl Horn budget route. I don't really feel like she fits into that team. So probably not those. In terms of Finite, she doesn't hit enough. So you're probably not going to use her for Finite. Dragon's Lair, absolutely great. You can cleanse the poisons as they come in. Unless you're doing a strategy like I have here, my new team that I've just built a couple of days ago is using Green Warden, and Ruark and Teodor to send the poisons back. I don't want the poisons cleansed because I want to send them back onto the boss. Not a great strategy in that situation. But if you're using Dragon to climb, she can cleanse away the fears. She can take the stun. If you put her with White King Narsus, she becomes immune to the boss's stun. So you can cleanse the poisons away and give yourself strength and, and a shield. And then in Spider Den, she can cleanse your tank target from being stunned, uh, from taking poisons, cleanse them away. Ice Golem, she will make herself immune to freeze or someone will be immune to freeze. So again, if you put your tankiest champion in highest crit damage in a very weird build then they would be immune to freeze so you don't ever get like frozen out from being able to complete ice golem um so yeah that is ancora now just to show you her true power in arena i did do a bit of an arena focus i've actually dropped out someone someone decided to, to defeat my team um for some reason uh, i've dropped out just a second here so we can see if we can find a team what is she very good for well we can see in this team here uh, i can pick my new team setup that I've got. So we can set it up with the duo. Obviously this, I would use her predominantly if I had Narsus in Arena. If I don't have Narsus, she wouldn't be my necessarily go-to pick, but she is quite useful. I just think that she falls below people like Elva, Duchess, Siffy, uh, Raglin. They just become a little bit more powerful because their revives are a little bit more consistent. Uh, and they bring more with their kit. Uh, because she doesn't have a block debuffs when she cleanses, it means that you can just be simply like refrozen by a, a Tormin or you can be re cc'd. Bit of issues here. So it just reduces the, um, the value of it. But this is the type of team that I'm running at the moment as my live arena and classic arena team. Sometimes I'll pivot to the Arbit if I want to go faster, but you can see I'm pretty much going really, really quickly here. I can do this, I can set up my buffs. And buffs on Narcissus is really good for his A3 because it helps make this ability hit much harder. Um, we obviously can't do that here because we've got the thing, but we could probably just one shot and do some damage. Then we can give a turn here. And this is where it's powerful because we can just reset abilities. And our Narcissus is going to have his A2 back again. Now that Mithral has put the shield and strengthen out, this is perfect because now we can just absolutely double hit them. And that's where white queen uh, that's where ancora is going to be valuable in arena being able to keep your white king narsus having his abilities constantly we do have to deal with this horrible combination which is wukong and ultimate death knight and again cleanse away those block buffs awesome i know we didn't a2 there we can't really do anything until we lose the stone skin of ultimate death knight which is you know a typical issue we get three buffs here we can kill him, get an extra turn. He, she will also grant Narsus an extra turn for Arena, which is very valuable. And then we could just try and break this ultimate death knight. We finally broke it. We can give an extra turn. We can try and reduce his cooldowns. But again, weak hitting will be a problem, but we did reset his abilities. So as long as we don't get absolutely one shot here, which we shouldn't do, we should be able to do a bit of a turn meter boost and finish off the team there with a double hit. So that is her incredible value in Arena. It's making Narsus get his A2 back. Like she pretty much gave Narsus an extra two A2s where we would have had to wait an entire rotation to get them back because of her A1 ability. Shujian obviously is giving her extra turns. That's how I would use it there. But I wanted to focus predominantly on using Ancora on her own without Narsus. What can she do? Very good in Hydra, very good for climbing Doom Tower. You saw we beat the hardest stage in Doom Tower this rotation without really stressing uh, too much. I did it on full auto. Obviously they're using Romantu, but you can substitute that without Romantu. Uh, and we're also seeing a good value in, in, in a couple of other the bosses as well, like Grithian. I think it'd be very good. Um, let me know, guys, in the comments below. What are you using your White Queen Ancora for? Are you putting her in a different build? Are there any particular sets you've tried her on? I know that some people have asked me about Supersonic on her. I don't think she's very good for Supersonic. She just doesn't do enough turn meter control. But that is a set I need to do some investigations in, in terms of how it's actually working and is it actually any good. So keep your eyes peeled for that video when I do it. I'm really curious to see where other people have found good uses for Ancora. I think she is in one of those windows where she has the potential to be a really, really good reviver, but she'd also be underpowered versus other revivers at the same time. Just because she doesn't have that block debuffs on the A2 kind of weakens her skill set a little bit because you just can't protect your team from getting debuffs after it's been cleansed. I really like that with Elva. You cleanse, block debuffs, you've got a bit of immunity for a while. 
But let me know in the comments below, guys. Thanks for watching. And as always, if you enjoy watching some of these champion guides, I do want to try and do more champion focused guides this year. Um, let me know which champions you would really love to see a guide on. Uh, I will. I've got a wide collection of champions at this point. I've got a lot of the backlog. I know a lot of people are waiting for my Chronum guide. If I get an opportunity to save some books, then he's absolutely on the next list for champion. You can see I've already done a bunch of masteries. I just keep running out of books, which is why Ancora's passive is not booked because I had too many champions to book. So once he is booked, we will be doing a guide on Chronum. But if there are any other champions that you would really love to see a guide on or you don't know how to use, but you really want to, let me know in the comments below and I will absolutely do it. Hit that subscribe button as well if you're new here. If you haven't subscribed, about 56% of you watch my videos and are not subscribed. Make sure you hit the subscribe button to get notified the next time I upload. I tend to do daily uploads these days. And of course, I stream on YouTube on Mondays and Thursdays. So the, probably by the time this video goes out, I'll be streaming the day after this video. So if you want to hang out, you want to ask some questions, you need some help and guidance. We do some coaching on, on in terms of like giving advice about team building. We do a lot of Hydra. We do a lot of different fun things. Sometimes we go into spread cheating. Sometimes uh, if you want to hang out, feel free to hang out on this stream on this channel. We stream on YouTube around about 8 p.m. on Monday and Thursdays. Thanks for watching, guys, though, and I will catch you in the next video.